dungeons. For 30 years, they were the main cores of any Zelda game, a model that was probably perfected by the SNES title A Link to the Past. When Ocarina of Time came along, it had the responsibility of bringing the series into the third dimension, and that also included the dungeons. That wasn't a simple task, of course. Dungeons rely a lot on the player's ability of understanding the space around the character, but a three-dimensional space is much more complex than a series of two-dimensional floors. How did the developers tackle the task of acclimating players to the new era of Zelda, and what new tricks were enabled by the new dimension? So far, we have talked about Ocarina of Time's controls and how it changed the Zelda series by leaping into 3D. Today, I want to talk a little about the game's dungeon design, specifically focusing on the first three dungeons. The very first dungeon, Inside the Deku Tree, doubles as a showcase for the new possibilities on 3D space. Before Ocarina, dungeons that had multiple floors had each one on a separate map, without any real connection between them. Now, the whole level is inside a gigantic tree trunk, with everything seamlessly accessible. This change also helps with how atmospheric the game feels. While the dungeons in A Link to the Past did each have their own unique theme and appearance, the limitations of the SNES meant they tend to blend together after a while, not helped by the fact the Light World dungeons and the Dark World dungeons each share a common background music. <laughs> Every dungeon in Ocarina of Time, by contrast, is incredibly unique. We have the insides of a giant tree, a cave with a dinosaur skull, the insides of a giant fish, and that is just the initial child dungeons. Once the player gets to the temples proper, each one fully embraces its naming theme. The fire temple is literally inside a volcano, the dreaded water temple has Link changing the water level to reach new areas, the Shadow Temple is full of torture devices and bizarre imagery, and the Spirit Temple embraces its desert location with architecture inspired by ancient Egypt. The only temple that doesn't quite fully embrace its naming in the whole game is the Forest Temple, a relatively non-foresty castle-like dungeon that just happens to be inside a forest. There is a reason for that. During development, the Forest Temple was initially meant to be the Wind Temple, not only that, but there is some evidence that the design that eventually did become the Forest, then Wind Temple, was by itself originally meant to be a Hyrule Castle dungeon. Anyway, also helping the atmospheric feeling of these dungeons is the music. Instead of the repeating and tense themes of the previous game, the dungeons of Ocarina start with slow and almost silent background music. <laughs> As the game escalates, the adult dungeons tend to have more actual music going on, but always keeping it relatively low-key, as the player is going to be listening to that on loop for a while. <laughs> Over the previous four released games in the series, all dungeons follow the pattern of being slowly opened up by small keys found after small challenges based either on combat or puzzles. The first three dungeons of Ocarina of Time are the very first in the series that do not have keys to open doors. Instead, these dungeons rely on environmental puzzles to create a more natural progression through space. I suspect this was done to ease the transition for new players. Remember that this game was released at a time where a 3D game where you could freely explore the environment like this was something very novel, and the developers certainly assumed many people would have problems adjusting. Not having areas arbitrarily locked with keys forces the path forward to be coherent and relatively linear. As an extra in-universe justification, 
Those three dungeons are the only ones that are natural environments, instead of long lost temples. The Deku Tree itself also works as an extended tutorial. After exploring Kokiri Forest, the player has already learned the basic controls and gotten a sword and shield. On the way to the tree, there are a few non-hostile Deku Babas. Those particular plants are just a roadblock to get the player used to attacking and maybe targeting. Once Link enters the tree itself, the camera pans to show the whole area. The clear focal point here is the huge spider web in the center. This immediately tells the player they are supposed to eventually find a way down this hole. While a place this big might seem overwhelming at first, this dungeon is naturally very simple. Most enemies here are aggressive Dekubabas, but they're rooted and therefore not really dangerous. There are also not many places Link can go at first. The central hole is naturally blocked, and access to the upper levels is impossible due to the spiders on the vines. This leaves only one place to go, a door in the second level leading to a room with a Deku Scrub. The Deku Scrubs are what could be called the overarching puzzle of this level as they are an element that escalates to the end. They can't be hit by the sword, as they just hide when Link gets close, so the player has to learn how the shield can be used to deflect their projectiles here. This is followed by a room with the slingshot. This is Link's first projectile weapon, and its use changes the view to first person. The player reaches the chest containing the item by jumping through a falling platform, leaving Link stranded. To leave the room, you must equip the slingshot and shoot a ladder that Navi points you to, meaning you can also target it. Just like that, the player is already aware that using the slingshot changes the perspective and also likely that targeting pulls it back to third person and allows Link to move. Once Link has the slingshot, the most natural course of action is climbing the vines that were blocked by spiders. Once in the upper level, there is an optional room that houses the compass. Link can now also jump from one of the center leaning platforms to fall on the web, rupturing it and opening access to the floor below. The room with the compass is optional, but it introduces the player to a few new concepts. First, a time-based switch that raises platforms leading to the chest. Next, to the left, there is a Skotula protecting an area with what will likely be the player's first gold Skotula. These are the game's longest side quests, and are frequently used in dungeons as a way of adding extra puzzles that aren't required to reach the end. Finally, to leave the room, the player has to use a Deku stick obtained from the non-hostile Deku Baba to light the torch on fire and open the door. Back to the main hall. The setup with the spiderweb is unique to this level, and clearly something that couldn't be done in earlier games. It allows the player to go ahead without the need of keys in the level, but I don't think this particular implementation is as clear as it could be. There is no prior indication that jumping from a height can rupture the web. In fact, jumping from the second floor makes the web shake a bit, but doesn't rupture it. The player is left to rely on Navi's advice or simply on blind luck by jumping from the third floor by accident. It's nothing particularly hard, but as a 6 years old with limited knowledge of the English language, I spent far longer than I'm proud to admit stuck on this web. Seriously, it was like a week. Following this fall, the underground part of the dungeon is completely linear, with a succession of rooms with simple puzzles. The room Link falls into has a button that, once pressed, lights a torch and burns the spiderweb blocking the way. This ensures the player knows fire can be used on these. Next, there is another Deku Scrub that tells Link the secret to fight the boss. Defeat the three scrubs guarding it on the correct order. This is this level's equivalent to the boss key. The game now uses this linear stretch to teach the player a few more important concepts, notably swimming, diving, and pushing blocks. The last room before looping back requires the player to light a deco stick on fire in order to burn another web that blocks the way. This room also has a new enemy, the Goma Larvas. Those enemies are much more mobile than the Deku Babas, 
but have a long wind-up period for their attacks where their eyes glow red. This works both to ramp up the tension on the final part of the dungeon and to prepare the player for the eventual boss fight. Once those last few rooms are complete, Link loops back to the room he fell in after breaking the spiderweb, only to find another web blocking his path. There is a block here that can be dropped off, allowing Link to freely move back to this elevator part, light a deco stick on fire and proceed to the boss. Note that this is, by all means, the final exam of the level. It requires the player to push blocks and understand both how to get rid of spiderwebs and light deco sticks on fire to do so. Once the player defeats the three scrubs guarding the boss room in the correct order, the last one outright explains how to win the fight ahead. Finally, the boss, Queen Goma. This fight is unique in that it requires direct input from the player to start the battle. She will crawl on the ceiling until Link looks up, which will then make her drop and attack. The fight itself is simple, with Goma mirroring the Goma larvas from before and being vulnerable while her eye is red. It also requires the use of the slingshot, tying up everything neatly. The next two dungeons also follow this looping, keyless design strategy. Dodongo's Cavern is centered around a big Dodongo school, with Link circling the main chamber and eventually opening the skull by throwing bombs at its eyes. Jabu Jabu's belly doesn't have a big and open main area, but has a central room with holes that drop into different rooms. It also directs players through the dungeon by requiring Link to carry Princess Ruto around, and later destroy these tentacles that open up new passages. As simple as those three initial dungeons are in terms of gameplay, I suspect designing them was almost harder than the later ones. As the designer can't rely on using keys, there has to be another logical way of keeping Link from making a beeline to the boss. In fact, the more I think about it, this self-looping level design that relies on environment changes to open up new areas and specially creates shortcuts reminds me a lot of the level design of some Dark Souls areas. While Dark Souls does have keys, they are usually used to open up new areas. Inside the same areas, progression is usually handled by looping around with one-way doors and dropping ladders, much like the sort of looping that happens in the Deku Tree, Todongo's Cavern and Jabu Jabu's Belly. The Adult Link dungeons return to the key lock system and end up being much more complicated to navigate, such as the Water Temple, or much more linear, such as the Shadow Temple. But none of them is spatially organized in the same way the keyless dungeons are. Of course, I don't mean that the key system is worse, but not having them in a dungeon clearly forces the space to be designed in a much more deliberate and, in some ways, interesting way. Sadly, later games in the series returned to having keys starting from the first dungeon. Breath of the Wild did eliminate keys in its main dungeons, but those have a much more open structure that is hardly comparable to a traditional Zelda dungeon. If you're interested in getting a more general look at dungeons in the Zelda series, I suggest watching the ongoing analysis Mark Brown from Boss Keys is doing. I'll leave a link in the description. And that's all for today. I think I still have more stuff to talk about Ocarina of Time to warrant one more video. But next time we have more level design analysis lined up, this time with the second part of my Doom analysis. As always, thank you very much for watching this all the way to the end. If you want more level design, you can watch my videos on Mega Man and Super Mario World. If my content interests you, please consider doing the usual YouTube thing of liking, subscribing, sharing and others. Thank you again, and until next time.